Alrighty, let's get started. <laughs> Your objective, right from the start, even if you literally know nothing at all about building, is not to be good at building right from the start. Um, people that both do and don't know what they're talking about are going to expect you to be good at it. They are going to be yelling at you while you're trying to be helpful, <laughs> and, and they're just not going to understand what you're trying to do. From their perspective, all they see is a random random dude on the internet or dudess um, putting down a piece somewhere and they just feel like that shouldn't be the case or that it should be them doing it. But the thing to keep in mind is that if it's not being done, it's not being done. Somebody, somebody needs to do it and learning doesn't happen all at the same time. Um, so if you keep a learner's mindset for a really long time and make your goal literally just to improve and learn, a little bit each time you make a new base, you're doing exactly what you should be doing, and everyone else can just, you know, sit and spin. Uh, so it's war start. Uh, the server hasn't started officially, or for most people, for like half an hour. Um, you want to put roots down, but aren't sure where to start. The very first thing that you need to do is find a truck, and and literally everyone is going to be doing the same thing. They're all going to be going to the closest depot and the closest seaport, and they're going to try to get a truck, and they are going to then try to find beat mats. You're going to be trying to do the exact same thing. If you do find a truck, find an out-of-the-way relic base, like the one that we just spawned from, or Town Hall, take out 1,500 beat mats, and, and then you're set. If you can't find a truck, you need to take 100 beat mats from somewhere um, and build a fresh one in a garage, which you just have to pray is going to be close by. Uh, go to your closest refinery, put 200 BMATs into a crate of shovels, wait for the shovels to finish, grab the crate, find the closest town hall or relic base to wherever you're plotting a practice BB. Um, preferably it should be somewhere not directly on the front line, because it, it will get its, you know, crap pushed in. Um, especially if you're, if you're still learning. Um, yet it should still be at something that should be defended but isn't critical, like a lone salvage field or mine. There is always a salvage field or a mine tucked away somewhere that probably should have defenses against like sweat lord partisans, but don't. Um, and so you've you've now found yourself your your town hall relic. Um, you want to submit the crate of shovels that you grabbed from the the factory, and you want to uh, put it into the relic base or whatever the static base is. Um, you're going to take two shovels that you from the relic, uh, relic base or town hall, take 100 BMATs out of your truck and build a construction vehicle while keeping the two shovels in your inventory. Transfer the rest of the trucks like 1,200 BMATs and half of the trucks gas to the CV and drive to the whatever general area you're planning on building in. Um, so, you know, we got the truck, we have the BMATs, we have the shovels, which is like all that you need in order to, you know, start building your, your dream house, your Barbie dream house, oh my god. Um, you've got shovels um, are ready to go, and now you're like, okay, what now? <laughs> you, The game needs you to have six pieces of any configuration as long as one of them is a blank square piece in order for you to make your bunker base proper. If you have five, it's not going to work. You can technically have a million, but for reasons that I'll explain later, you don't want that. Um, you can have an unlimited number of people digging at a blueprint. You can have three people building a single piece, um, upgrading a single piece, building it like a single thing. Um, if stuff starts getting blasted, you can have three people safely repairing a single piece at a time. Um, allegedly, you can have three people per piece, um, like this giant structure over to our west here. You could have three people on each piece all repairing, and it'll it'll speed up the uh, the repair speed considerably. So if you follow me over me all, you're gonna you're gonna be seeing this cluster a lot on the front line by people who either desperately want something down now and literally don't care what it looks like or have future considerations or um, it just and this is fine if they just don't know any better like this is the bare minimum that you want so for example you would have your cv with you you would dig out all six of these pieces then you would have the entrance like plotted here 300 of the b mats would be going into the the tile itself 
and then you would use the rest of the theme mats to upgrade all the pieces that are around it to tier two to make them look like wood. And then whatever is left over, you should have like 200 or something. You would put um, garrison modifications in them using the upgrade tool of your hammer. Uh, and then you would, you'll probably have some spare left over. And after about 15 minutes or so, you'll then be able to um, use the rest of your beam mats to throw down a couple of rifle garrisons on your core to protect it in the meantime. Uh, once you're very comfortable with building, you'll start to intuitively know what you can get away with. Uh, but until then, for space considerations, you'll want to restrict yourself to have a core to be somewhere between 10 to 15 pieces, uh, which is this example over here that we originally started at. Um, this is pretty close to the base design that I have um, in Endless Shore right now. With the bunker core being right here, the ramp extending out uh, towards the road, a rifle garrison on each of these corners, and then a howitzer garrison on on the backs, um, facing, you know, differing diagonal directions, like facing the frontal. Um, and what, uh, as far as like your main considerations for exactly where your core should be in relate, it, it it really is gonna, it's it's gonna be up to you, which is which is not a great thing to hear. But if, if you want my entirely subjective opinion, you need to balance between how easy Logi is going to be able to get to your base to supply it with how annoying it is, it's going to be for the enemy to get to your core, uh, which is not always an easy balance. Um, you can make it easier on yourself in the long run by incorporating like an emergency fallback way of getting supplies into your base such as having cranes set up at the part of the base for this from what's likely going to be the front um, so that you can crane in like trucks full of supplies and small ship containers directly into the base. So the people that are bringing you supplies are not exposed and the people that are unloading are also not exposed. Um, let's see. Uh, once all your pieces are dug out, you can reserve. Well, you can, but you should. Absolutely, 100% of the time, you should reserve all of the pieces under whatever squad you're going to be in. And then you have to remember to re-reserve it every one and a half days. Um, the reason is, is that although it sucks, trolls do appear and like to do things like build garrisons where there shouldn't be, or put engine rooms and blank spots where there was never intended to be one and so on. Uh, once you have a power network of engines, you're also going to want to incorporate refueling them into this like one and a half day routine that you'll set up for yourself. You're gonna wanna find some friends to join the squad and keep the reservations and gas up if you think that you're gonna be away for more than a couple days. The reason being is that once the uh, reservations expire, the there is no way to put the reservations back on there. It's literally like, <laughs> it, it's, it's a completely open experience for anyone that cares to come by and do whatever they want or add whatever they want or upgrade to whatever they want. Um, some builders will say um, that you should never build garrisons on your core except howitzer garrisons further down the line. Um, things like rifle garrisons, machine gun garrisons, and so on. The reason they're saying that is because it affects the amount of health the structure has. This brings us to uh, structure health, uh, which was completely obscure to the Foxhole community until about like six plus wars ago. Prior to that, the only indicator we had of how our choices affected the health of the structures we were working on was the structure integrity, which you could see by going into like your upgrade menu with your hammer hovering over it, and then you'll see a value from uh, critical, low, medium, and high. Uh, for all we knew, uh, integrity meant health and was a value that seemed to go down the more pieces you attach to a structure. Um, how structure health works has since been data mined. And we learned that the structural integrity has nothing to do with hit points itself, but is best thought of how resource and time intensive in total it is to repair the structure overall. Ultimately, and again, drawing from first-hand experience, what really matters is how much punishment a defense structure can take before it goes down than how long it takes to repair it to full. Um, because the whole idea is, is that if your base is getting fucked, <laughs> you're you're good. You kind of want to make sure that it lasts as long as possible until help comes, or until the enemy has grinded themselves for so long into the front of your base that um, that they just 
they run out of supply or there's some other kind of issue or they get you know surrounded themselves or whatever happens um so how big should bases be um if it's war start your only way of telling how big your base this is going to sound really stupid because it is your only way of telling how big your base should be is by putting down a watchtower and trying to eyeball all of your blueprints to be within the 80 meter radius that you see on the map the watchtower should be placed wherever you're considering putting your core's entrance uh, because the core entrance is what creates that umbrella of automatic defense turning on AI um, and stop structures in that 80 meter radius of decaying when supplied with uh, garrison or bunker supplies. Once you have everything puzzled out, you can then demo the watchtower with mammons, dig out your core for real this time, and then pray that your your guess was right of, of how of, of making sure that all of your defenses were like within the 80 meter radius. This dumb sounding process is made a lot easier when we get access to binoculars. Uh, which thankfully comes quickly, but really should be tier zero um, because it removes all the guesswork. You literally get a, a readout of how far away from the core um, <laughs> your stuff should be and is by standing on top of it and just looking around with, with binoculars. Um, for reference, static buildings on the map also provide AI coverage and that same decay protection when they're supplied with garrison or bunker supplies. Relic and town bases, uh, like the one over there, Camp Hollow, are functionally identical as far as we're concerned and have 150 meters of coverage, which is which is a huge amount. That's why like at places like Foxcatcher, you have you can safely keep alive like a million bases surrounding it because the 150 meters is so big. Safe houses also have a hundred meter blanket, so it's about twenty meters more of a radius than a normal core is or an encampment. And encampments have the same like 80 meter radius. Uh, you do need the small garrison improvement for whatever the type of thing it is for the AI coverage to work, unless you have 10 people keeping their spawn set to the thing at all times. Um, if if nine out of 10 people have their spawn set to the thing, the AI will turn off. It does not matter. Um, so that's why on on like fronts, you hear people screaming all the time, "Set your spawn to this thing because it just lost AI and they're." They're <laughs> pushing, you know, they're pushing really hard at us. Help, we're panicking. Um, if the thing I itself that's giving the AI coverage ever dies, the game gives you 10 minutes, as long as it has rifle garrison or small garrison, uh, gives you 10 minutes that the defenses and that umbrella stay alive before they turn off. Um, so if, you know, if it gets real bad, you have about 10 minutes before, you know, you just lose everything. Um, so, that's all well and good. Uh, you have your core all plotted out, and, like, you're thinking of building defenses and stuff, and you're thinking to yourself, like, okay, well, you know, what, what defenses, <laughs> defenses are good. On front lines, you will see an endless sea of, uh, one by threes. And by that, I mean, like, a rifle garrison, blank piece in between, because you can't have two combat garrisons touching each other, and then a rifle garrison. Um... In the extremely early game, sure, that that's fine. You know, you gotta do what you gotta do. If you want your your bases to last for any real amount of time, you have from the very start you have to try to think about the the idea that your base is gonna live forever. Even if it's not, even if there's no chance that it's gonna live forever, there are different reasons that you would want to be careful with how you build out your defenses. Um, at the front line. The one by ones and the one by threes are unavoidable because people are creeping. They're trying to make as much progress using the one to two meters of of you know gain that they get as they can. So there's no avoiding that. Um, but if you have space and you have time, you should try to build out your base to live uh, as long as possible. So we'll go over to the first example of what a defense structure used to look like and still does um it and there's a reason why it's so prolific and common still <clears throat> you may have heard of this before um this is a w the the premise is and i have to wait for my freaking like marker to, 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 to show back up come on come on the middle bit that part is going to be an at the two blank pieces to the size of it would be rifle garrisons 
these two diagonal squares in the back would be Hauser garrisons, typically with their barrels crossed to the middle, so there's only like a 45 degree slice of coverage that's missed way in the back. But you would be ideally pointing these, like the direction of the Hauser garrisons towards wherever the enemy is likely to be coming from anyway. Um, these were, and still are, uh, like I said, used a lot. You're going to see these all over the place now you're going to see these all over the place uh in the future it's because for an extremely long time it was just assumed that it was the end all be all defense it's also very easy to learn it's not complicated the halberd which i'll take you over here actually i went the wrong way yeah follow me in here go south the halberd here is this the halberd is a weird like bird chicken looking thing um, I guess you could reason that it looks like the axe head of like a halberd or something. It's just, I just don't like that word. <laughs> but that's what it's called. That's what, that's just what it's, what it's called now. Um, there's no way around it. The halberd is, uh, considered in some circles, um, building circles primarily to be the next step up. And it's what I've been using and experimenting with since understanding what the point of its design is. Um, with smoke grenades and even without smoke grenades, rifle garrisons are, are very easy to dodge and they can sometimes take like three spaced out shots if they all hit to kill a person. Um, so the time to kill is pretty high. The point of the halberd is to strap as many front facing machine guns and overlapping cones as you can get away with. So if one of the garrisons is suppressed, it's not completely defenseless on, on a side unless that side is very exposed. Um, so from the front, you, you, like people have to suppress at least two of the machine gun garrisons, um, which are on the sides there, including this one that I'm standing right next to. And that recessed uh, bunker piece that's in the center there is, yeah, exactly, is also the machine gun garrison. The, the cones are just wide enough to make sure that like the, the people are that are on, coming towards your base have to be like that close to not be shot at so they're gonna die um <laughs> the, the middle at of the the w is uh, like ats by themselves have 180 degrees of coverage um but because the at is sandwiched between two rifle garrisons it loses like 45 degrees of coverage on both sides so unless the tank is is literally approaching it almost from the front it, the tank is is just going to avoid the front and try to hit it from the sides um, and then it's very easy for them to take down uh, the rest of your W's from there the halberd is different in that it tries to keep as much coverage as possible on the ATs because the MGs are recessed into the design and it doubles the amount of ATs that it has to work with so if it's being attacked from the front or even slightly from the side, like a ballista, it actually has a chance to gun down whatever is hurting it very quickly. Machine gun garrisons also have the benefit of doing damage to um, like armored cars and, and other light things like that. Um, and uh, they give slightly more health to the overall structure that they're a part of than the rifle garrison. Um, the machine gun garrison also has uh, time to kill that's a lot lower than a, than a rifle garrison even if blocked by smoke, because it spits out so many bullets that it partially negates the accuracy debuff that it gets. Somewhat of a downside um, is that it's very, it do be wide. <laughs> it's, it's a very wide design, uh, which can make it difficult to fit in terrain with lots of hills or trees, or especially both. Um, you'll learn with time what you can or cannot get away with terrain-wise. Um, if the base is that you're building is in a natural choke, uh, where you don't have to worry about getting defenses to curve around whatever you're trying to protect, uh, you can just make a wall of, of these like halberds. And if it's if they're all front facing, it's I'm gonna be real with you. I don't really know what the enemy could could do about it besides being ultra sweaty with like satchel ops and having like three machine gunners and stuff like that. But then again, no base is gonna survive that. That's just accepted. Um, if you do need to curve defenses, uh, you have two choices. Either put down a new structure that is angled very slightly 
towards whatever angle you're trying to protect, or extend out the original structure by curving it in some way. Uh, regardless of how you decide your defenses uh, should look, the most important consideration, especially if you're trying to make something like a mega base, is never extending your furthest garrison more than 40 spaces from your core entrance tile. This is a hard limitation. The game simply will not allow you to build anything that your base has upgrades for if it's like further than 40 tiles. The game will also tell you that this isn't happening. <laughs> so you literally have to count piece by piece from your core entrance if your base is going to be very wide to make sure that your furthest defense is still within the 40 tiles. And by tiles, I mean like but these bunker pieces or trenches. It has to be 40 things within 40 things of the, the core itself. An example of how to curve this halberd is my own design, which I'm still playtesting, which is this, which is this weird thing here. Um, if you glance between them, you can see similarities where it's like half of it is normal, but there are there's a sequence of corner pieces there that allow it to turn with two machine gun garrisons in the center. This this allows you to make a 45 degree turn. And if you mirror it in another structure on the other side, you can do like as many 45 degree turns as you really need to until you end up with a like a big pit in the middle um, of free space, which you know you can use for any kind of activities that I'll go over later. Um, it still has the two Houser garrisons that ideally you would want for coverage, which you can angle however you would want. Uh, the ATs are still in the places that make sense, with the distinction of this being an AT, the next two pieces to the northwest, or, or to, its, to its right, are machine guns, right, exactly, and those cover, cover the center, and then the AT like normal, and a machine gun as the very last piece on the side. Um, this gives a huge amount of coverage where typically people will understandably would have trouble approaching, like how, understanding how to deal with tanks approaching corners. Because, you know, corners are typically very vulnerable in this game um, just because it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to come up with a design that actually stops a person from approaching the corner of your base. Um, this seems to me to be a way to deal with that um, while making sure that if the enemy is approaching at the corner, both ATs will still fire um, and that they're both getting somewhat of the same amount of coverage of machine guns. If you have something called an anti-satchel pit, which is literally just uh, like, a sat like a string of trenches that is spaced like five meters in front of your your defense section, but you also have like pits for emplacements and stuff that we'll talk about later um, in front. Later in late game, its satchelers have to figure out how to deal with that because they can't get close enough to your defenses in order to satchel them. So they either have to satchel the trenches themselves, which is a huge waste of time and gives you plenty of warning um, or they just have to try to free ball it in some other way. Alright, so uh, I've explained all that, and this too, and that, just by thinking about it. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that regardless of how you want your base to uh, be set up, I, and under ideal conditions, as in you're not getting shot at, <laughs> You're going to want to blueprint your entire base out, if, if at all possible. The reason why is when a piece is fully dug out, the ground around it slightly changes, making it impossible to build extremely close to it like you could while they were still blueprints. So I'm going to get my shovel out and I will show you. When that piece is dug out, 
it's it's going to look as though they're they're touching, even though they're not. You would be able to walk from one to the other, um, like Super Mario Three. <laughs> uh, if once it's all like, well, yeah, you can do it now. Even you can just get on top of it. Uh, once it's fully dug out, which we might as well just if you have shovels, just stick it out so you can see what I mean. Even though you see it all the time, it's different when you understand the implications of the terrain changing. <clears throat> okay, so that's dug out. I'm going to delete this piece because I don't need it anymore or explain what it was. If you have your shovel out, it's, it's very difficult to actually get stuff as close as, as it was before. Um, it looks as though there's no difference. I, I promise you, when you are building, when you're getting used to building, you will definitely notice a difference. It also is problematic in the sense that if, like, for example, if all this was dug out, the terrain changes will make it impossible for you to ever get something that was dug out right next to it, close to it again. Um, it also interferes with how uh, trenches behave when you're extending out from them, and that you won't be able, you'll lose about like 45 to 60 degrees of angle um, on the trench itself. So basically, if you have like a structure already built out and you want to connect something next to it, like you have to make sure that it's not at a hard angle, like with the trench connector. It basically has to be like straight out. Um, if you were to have a diagonal piece like this, and you were trying to, you know, make a trench connector go over here and go west, the game won't allow you because it's getting pissed off that there's raised terrain right here that could be blocking it. Um, among other, you know, BSC type reasons why. It's just more convenient overall. Um, so, it, you may or may not have thought to yourself, uh, because, you know, we all hear it all the time. Uh, these are, like, pretty big pieces. Uh, I hear... You know, like how durable these are supposed to be. Like, don't, don't, the, won't these like fold if you just throw like a single mammon at it and it'll just like, it'll die immediately. LOL, LOL. Um, it, if, if the people that are talking about that get the data mine numbers themselves, um, or the bunker place, the bunker base planner tools that, that are out there, um, if they have some other type of like, not hard numbers to work with that you know preferably are provided from dead man themselves um that would be great uh, all we have to work with are is just on faith that that these tools and these numbers and stuff that the, the population has said to have been found are accurate or not they could be totally wrong i i have before my own sanity i have to believe that they're true because uh, like at first hand experience it seems like it's accurate um but you know it, you will you will develop fear yourself of feeling whether or not you know you feel that way. Uh, so the W that I showed you uh, before, when it's upgraded to tier two, aka it looks like wood, before any of it is concreted or house or garrisons added, is around 6,800 health. Um, that's with the AT and the the rifle garrisons attached to it. Um, that is a little over a dozen color rounds directly hitting it before it explodes, um, assuming no one is repairing it. The Hallbird's health is very slightly less when it's tier 2. And this curved version over here has very slightly less than that. However, once they're concreted in full, even after Howitzer Garrisons are added, they'll jump to over 20,000 health, which is like over 40... No, it's going to be more like 50 or 60 color rounds before it goes down. Um, and there's a reason for that. Uh, it's important to remember, too, that each tier of upgrade from burlap tier 1 to wood tier 2 to dry concrete tier 3 confers a damage reduction benefit to it, with concrete set to ignore a good fraction of the explosive damage that it takes. There's one exception, uh, which is satchels. It causes a special damage type explosion called demolition that concrete um, has no way of reducing. Hydra's Whispers, which the Kali's never use for some reason, um, also cause that same demolition damage. Uh, concrete has a 24-hour drying period, with it being the most vulnerable to damage in its first six real-life hours, uh, being somewhat vulnerable from hour 7 to 24 and getting its full resilience after hour 24 when it looks like rain and it's not 
It's not like wet looking anymore. That's why you hear people screaming excitedly in Intel chat when they find undefended wet concrete. Um, you can tell most of the time, unless it's snowing, if a concrete piece is still wet by whether it looks dark gray instead of light gray, and if it has a reflective sheen to it. Uh, because snow covers literally everything, sometimes really densely, and like all the particle effects and crap like that, it can make it very difficult to tell. So if you're extremely cheeky, and the, you know, and the stars align, you could try to time concreting your base to when it's snowing. But that relies on so many variables that, you know, I just wouldn't, I just wouldn't worry about that. Um, because of this damage reduction, if at all possible, you want to prioritize concreting your bunker core pieces first, because the enemy is going to beeline for that if they if they can. Uh, they want that <laughs> that to die as soon as possible. So you're going to want that completely concreted um, ASAP. You'll, your next order is going to be the front face and garrison pieces because they're likely to get hit first and then continue in that manner wrapping away all the way to whatever the back of your base is supposed to be. You then concrete the innards of the structures and then the pits and the emplacements you'll hopefully have uh, the space to place outside your base. Um, the reason uh, for the, the massive jump in health from wood and concrete I mentioned is, is to is due to the health multiplier each type of bunker piece has. Okay, so this is this is where it gets really confusing, and it's not something you should actively think have to actively think about until you get lost in the sauce, like me. Like I'm I'm I see the matrix and I can't get out of it. So so I'm done for. Like you still have a chance. You still have a chance to back out before I give you this information. Um, all you need to know is if is if you're relatively new to building. Is that each bunker piece has its own amount of health, where if it was just chilling by itself, like the piece that you're standing on right now, if it's upgraded to tier two, it would have about 1,800 health. It has a variable associated with it that does math. Um, if it gets a second piece attached to it, and that secondary piece also gets the receiving end of that variable, so you have two pieces chilling by by themselves that are both affecting each other. In English. When you have two pieces that are attached to each other, instead of it doubling that 1800 health, it is multiplying a percentage of health it's allowed to keep against whatever else is attached to it, and then multiply it by to however many other pieces that, that are involved. Um, in this case, each piece that would be attached, um, if they were, t if it was just two pieces touching each other, like uh, as a structure. Um, is giving about 90% of its health to the other one as an overall structure. And that means that those two pieces are, as a unit, have 3,000 health, um, like the whole structure does. The more pieces that you attach, the more multiplication is happening, and health is still being contributed, but it matters less and less um, as that multiplier keeps happening. Um, the health uh, continuously goes up, um, until, and this is just a rough ballpark, it's gonna matter, you know, however many pieces and of what type um, are attached. Until you hit about 16 to 17 pieces, which is what this, you know, big mother effort is over here, um, where the diminishing returns are so great that you're only gonna be getting back about 100 extra health for each piece that you add, um, at least at tier two. Garrisons have their own variables that are harsher than blank pieces in the order of like a core entrance, engine rooms, howitzer garrisons, AT garrisons, rifle garrisons, and then machine gun garrisons like tend to keep the most of their original health. Ammo room upgrades also negatively affect the health slightly. Um, I, I would guess probably about like four or five percent. So you could think of it as like ammo room goes in the thing. It's lost about four or five percent overall. Uh, fringe type of types of garrisons like the Storm Cannon and Intel Weapon Super Weapon Center pieces also give really harsh benefit health benefit penalties on the same par, yay, <laughs> on, the, on the same par as, as like a, a core entrance. It's why you should never, ever, ever want a bunker core entrance jutting off of a Storm Cannon platform unless you're either extremely cocky or really, really know what you're doing. Like, you're just so absolutely, completely sure that the enemy is never going to get to it um, that, you know, you would you'd be willing to risk the biscuit like that. But I just I would just have them separate. Um, these health-affecting variables change a lot when the pieces uh, are concreted. 
the multiplier gets less punishing and the health of the piece counts for a lot more, especially in the case of blank pieces. When a blank piece, like the example that I gave you, where like each piece is giving like 90% of its health, um, it, when it's concreted, it gives 99% of its health instead. So it is not unreasonable to think that by adding a concreted blank piece, and that can be a corner or a full square piece, you're basically injecting 1800 health into the structure. Like if you wanted to get dumb, which, you know, I'm all about, you could have like a 30 piece long string of literally nothing but concrete squares, have sandbags like all along the top and do like, I don't know, that wall from Lord of the Rings. I forget what, not Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I mean, there is one in that. Uh, freaking Game of Thrones. I forgot about the series already, like everyone else. Um, now you shouldn't do that. You should use <laughs> the concrete for, for more constructive stuff, but that's just an example. Um, so you have all the angles covered as best as you can in your head cannon. Um, how easy it is to set up the base is going to be is going to depend entirely on the terrain. It's going to be nice to have a big flat space like the one that we're in and a strategic place to plot around. Uh, but the luxury of actually finding that is rare outside of War Start, um, just because you know all the big clan mans are going to be going are going to be beelining towards like all the the premium spots. And if you're a microscopic, you know, regiment or even worse, just a dude by yourself, um, it, it's going to get hoovered up. And, and people get by far the sweatiest at the at war start. They start to calm down after a while, but it takes like days. Um, so uh, adaptation is the rule. And sometimes the terrain is simply going to tell you what to do, regardless of how much you fight with it, if the area is important enough. Um, for now, all you have to do is make sure that your base survives long enough, long enough for help to arrive if it's attacked, or better yet, that it can withstand so much that it becomes the point that wardens know they can reliably push from. Uh, you do this by stocking it with the bare bones things players need to defend themselves. So 150 spawns worth at minimum of shirts, medical supplies, uh, enough uniforms, medical uniforms for those people, uh, an HE option, an AT option, so like stickies and mammons like at bare minimum, um, and so on and so forth. And then you can if you want to add like utility items to be nice, I would throw like no more than like 20 of each kind, 20 of each kind, like uh, wrenches and radios and stuff like that. Um, that seems to be the sweet spot for making sure that when you show up the next day, there's still going to be enough for you. Um, I'll reiterate that everything that I'm saying and have said is drawn entirely on first-hand experience with a healthy dose of subjective opinion. Um, you will work out over time for yourself what seems to be the most effective and mesh that with whatever style of builder you become organically. Okay, um, so we'll go back over to the core, over here. The the big the big honking one. So uh, we have to talk about garrisons attached to the core itself. Like I said before, the core entrance piece really compromises the health of whatever it's a part of. It has something savage, like a 75% multiplier to it, so you could think of it as like tanking the, the health of, of whatever it's wherever it's a part of. Um, you want it recessed enough that the enemy is not going to be able to easily easily reach it unless you feel pretty confident about like your overall base design. Um, but you want it close enough, preferably to a road, um, that Lodgy is not going to scream at you internally. Um, <laughs> like those posts like on the map like how am i supposed to get to this or like they they will just internally curse you out and you don't want that you want those people to want to come back to you to help you um in the past people would uh throw on like the four houts or garrisons all pointing opposite directions for the most part so that they wouldn't have to worry about getting it getting shelled um it was also back when uh house or garrisons would fire back on anything explosive um, but I don't really think that people set up their bases with that uh, strictly in mind. Uh, for each, for me personally, every base that I've personally lost um, has either been because it's been definitively cut off for days. No water lodgy, like the emergency backup method of getting a lodgy in is being, you know, controlled, or satchelers, or storm cannons. Um, it, it, I. I can't, I can't think of an example where, I'm, and I'm not gloating, I'm just stating, where my base has been lost because 
um, some angle has been exploited. Like if you want to, if you want to get real, Badman Larry, the man himself, the legend, complimented my base like some wars ago, saying like, you know, well, well, we're gonna take it out. This is a very impressive base, but you know, we're gonna be the ones to take it down. And then he he <laughs> fucked with it for like a solid 45 minutes to an hour, including hilariously getting shot out of his uh, LTD by. A, by a point defense uh, 120 that was built in the built in the center of it, and then he was like, "You know what? We'll we'll come back later." <laughs> it, was just, it was it was a very it was a very epic gamer moment. Um, so uh, because I'm afraid of Satchelers almost more than anything else, um, I always place two rifle garrisons on the front of my base on those on those corners. Um, it provides about 270 degrees of, you know, last <laughs> last ditch defense against bayonetters that are trying to, you know, re into your base, um, or satchelers who are trying to get close enough to, you know, finish the job. Um, the core is literally the beginning and end of the base, so I'd rather scrap about 5% of the health of the structure after it's concreted if it means that those people actually have to worry about getting close to the base proper um, so you protected yourself from infantry and tanks with all the different toys um, that i've shown you but how do you protect yourself against artillery oh, okay this is a big one uh, so typically artillery uh, becomes readily available for about two days uh, before your base is upgraded to have the option of putting down howitzer garrisons because you have to get the, the components first which literally everyone and their grandmother is fighting for you have to have enough in reserve to concrete out the blank spots that you want house or garrisons to go on. And then you have to pray that your base doesn't get shelled or attacked long enough for the concrete platform to dry so that you can then put a house or garrison on it. Um, so what do you do? <laughs> what, do, what, do, you fuck, what, do you fuck, what do you fuck do you do? Uh, it's not unusual during this period to go to bed not knowing if your base is going to be there in the morning, uh, which I experienced and have experienced every war. <laughs> because I just, I'm just like, it's not going to be there. Um, you just have to think of the whole practice as like a Buddhist sand painting, where it's, it's beautiful, it takes a huge amount of effort, and then just like that, it can be wiped away. Um, you just have to accept that that's going to be a thing. Either because the war ends or someone destroys your base, it's going to be going away for one reason or another. You have to accept that, and you just have to make peace and look at it constructively. That because there's always improvements that you could make. There's always ways of thinking that you're going to be developing over time in order to get yourself to a position where you can build the new base that much faster and more securely. Um, until then, <laughs> until you get all that other crap uh, set up, you have to. You're like your fellow man. And, and woman are going to be your counter arty. Um, I'm going to take you over the road east. <clears throat> Sorry, YouTube. This is just an example, um, but it also works for a compact base. Um, I always include two emplacement pits at the in the inside of of my base most often if i can swing it i will put three um three artillery pieces is the most that in my personal experience people are willing to deal with and to to crew at the same time um unless you're siege in which case you know you can get people to crew like 800 million at a time <laughs> for for like 30 45 minutes and then and then you go save a different hex. Um, 120 millimeter guns are going to be going in these pits. The reason why, the reasons why, um, are that they have relatively inexpensive ammo, uh, which is extremely plentiful, uh, both in terms of guns and ammo later in the game, because everyone wants to switch over to 150 millimeter. But they function just fine for killing huge balls of infantry, damaging tanks, and killing enemy arty and fresh enemy bunker bases. Like, the enemy is going to be trying to creep up to you, so if they're getting shelled by 120, it doesn't matter if it's if it's mid-game or late-game, 
it's still tier two stuff. It's still going to go down super fast. They still have to worry about repairing it as quickly as possible. And if they're repairing, they're not attacking you. And if they're not attacking you, then they're getting surrounded or dealt with in, in some other way. Um, you want to have like a blank spot, which we kind of talked about before, reserved in the in internal defenses. Um, you might have you might have the space to wrap it around uh, the pit so that you can put an ammo room in it. And this is just an example, although I've used it before. This this weird Star Fox looking <laughs> motherfuck that's that's over here. The the premise being is that this middle piece, the blank piece, is an ammo room. So the artillery crew has to walk exactly th like two three meters to get a to very quickly get a 120 out. Uh, because pulling out of an ammo room is like twice as fast as pulling out of a truck and also less annoying for everyone involved. Runs over here, shoots, and then it's it's almost like a storm cannon going off where the only limitation is how quickly the artillery crew can fire because there's no there's no truck involved. Like obviously until you run out of ammo, but that's that's a different uh, consideration. On the sides here would be howitzer garrisons. So by wrapping an internal layer of defense, if space allows, around your artillery pits, and you can have the, like two more pits off to the sides here, you are having a 360 degree of shell coverage. So if the enemy is trying to shell your crew, they, they are getting fucked. They're getting fucked so hard. Like if they shoot a shell just to test to see what happens, they're gonna get like at, at minimum like four howitzer garrisons firing back on them at the same time, and then they will just stop, <laughs> unless unless they're they're suicidal, they're they're just they're just gonna stop. Uh, so uh, we got the pit. Um, you can carry crates of 120 millimeter uh, ammo by hand and submit it directly to the ammo room. So if you're loading, which you would want to do ahead of time, you're just gonna have to make time for it, uh, even if it sucks. You drive up your truck to the front of the base, hop out, fill all eight slots of your inventory with 75 or with a uh, 120 millimeter, and then right click and submit the ammo room. Yeah, you don't have to take them out pie piecemeal. You just take them as whole ass crates of five, and you go to it as if it were a storage depot. Right click, hit submit, and you see the, and you see the ammo populate in real time. Like, you get a visual representation of the shells being filled. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And that's the, the thing is, is that the, the reason why that's not common knowledge is not your fault. It's it's because, I would say probably 80 to upwards of 90 to 95% of RD is done with trucks. Because people don't have the luxury of the concreted part being deliberately left alone and then you know the 10 concrete it takes to um put the ammo room in it and to have all that set up beforehand like the situation is real they have to get trucks into position you know they can't that setup is just completely different it's a completely different uh experience but if your base becomes frontline which you should always expect it to be um especially if it's within like one hex of whatever the, the front line is like and you have your ammo ready oh yeah yeah it's the game also like many things does not tell you that you could just you could just do that it doesn't say as far as i know it might i just never checked before um because you know it's like a little fiddly question mark and an ups and an obscure menu of like a, a niche <laughs> like a niche garrison upgrade um so yeah, uh, the artillery team will appreciate what you're doing because they feel protected and supplied. And when people aren't afraid of getting killed, as you can imagine, they perform better. Um, everyone wins. Uh, you'll want to put down a sign somewhere asking people not to move the artillery out of the pit, um, explaining that it's for point defense. Um, there is a 25% chance that they're going to do it anyway, um, but it does improve the chances that they'll listen and leave it alone, at least in my experience. The crane that you'll use to bring in the artillery piece can be positioned either on top or directly behind the defenses at the at the back of your base, um, so that the actual crane part is going to be overhanging the back of your base. Um, 
you want it to be positioned where it's least likely to, to see action. Uh, that can then be used to bring in supplies, like I mentioned before, in an emergency situation where too much is happening um, to the front of your base, so Logi can't safely get in. You then put a map post up saying, base designed for emergency Logi, go here. And then you have, I don't know, like an extra sign back there that says, you know, to safely, <laughs> to safely drop off supplies, you know, crane, crane here or something. Like you'll figure it out. Um, the the second amenity um, that I always try to include is an observation bunker. It can be as simple as a one by two with an engine room and the observation bunker attached to it. When it's powered, it acts like a super watchtower, giving a massive 130 meters of radar coverage at tier two, and an insane 180 meters of coverage when it's concreted, which it's a staggering radius. Um, sometimes I even forget that, you know, unless I, I look at the little observation tower icon, whether or not I'm looking at like an observation tower or not. Um, as you can imagine, people tend to perform better when they know what's going on or what to expect. So unless it's an unusual uh, circumstance, it should always be accommodated. Uh, the third amenity, which isn't technically an auto-include, but it should be accounted for at all possible, is an engine room network. Uh, Semi-annoyingly, I'm going to take you back to where we were, where the halberd is. Sorry, YouTube. I don't know, maybe I'll put like interlude music or something here. If people have the same attention span that I do. <clears throat> the the halberd is unique in that it has a gap like behind its machine gun and if you don't care to have like a neat and tidy and proper engine room block like somewhere in your base you can just shove a engine room like into this little corner gap here and then despite that raised ground issue that I told you about before, it's far enough away from both um, both garrisons that uh, it, it should be fine. It should allow you to place it back where it was without much issue. Um, engine rooms are hilariously weak also, so expect to replace them a lot. If the enemy is so unbelievably ballsy that they are willing to shell um, a defense section that is actively firing back on them. Uh, so, <laughs> let's talk about power. Let's talk about the power system. Every every engine room, when it's gassed, can supply up to five garrisons. It, in other words, each engine room is three thousand gives three thousand power, and can power a garrison, which it takes up six hundred power. The observation bunker is different, in that it takes a thousand power. The, 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 the power system in this game does not work how a normal person thinks a power system should work. It's not a pool of 3,000 that it's just giving to the grid. It is 3,000 that is being divided by however many garrisons are attached to it. What, con <laughs> what that means is, is that when you sometimes see on the front, like with all the power rooms, like stretching off in all different directions, you find some garrisons that say like 480 out of 520 power. It does not matter if like if the closest five garrisons to the engine room are getting power. If there's a sixth thing that is that is attached to that power network, it's going to divide it such that all of the garrisons have like 520 power or some BS, and literally none of them are going to turn on. And the game also doesn't doesn't explain that. It's also why when you make a, a super weapon, you should never, ever, 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 ever have a garrison run, running through that power line. The, the garrisons cannot even touch the power line at all because it will divide it and it will mess up how quickly your super weapon charges. Um, something else the game doesn't tell you is that the, the power system is limited by the number of pipes that are jutting out from between whatever the furthest defense is that you're trying to power and whatever the furthest engine is. So you have to make sure that your whatever you're trying to power is within 20 pipes worth of whatever the furthest engine room you want to connect to the grid. Um, so if you're looking at the, the halberd, 
The halberd has uh, five pieces attached to it. Quick and easy, brainless. You have your engine room, you have the pipes. It's all within 20 pieces, uh, or 20 pipes worth, like stemming out from the engine. If you think about it like a branch, you have to make sure that the branches are within uh, 20. If you have a halberd on the other side, and you have an engine room here, and you're literally just mirroring this, like side by side, the, the halberds are almost touching, and you have the engine rooms connected, you you are fine because it's going to be connected from one, two, three, four, five, six to this corner piece, seven, eight. So it needs to do eight jumps from the furthest engine room to the furthest like machine gun garrison that's over here. That means that if you try to connect, <laughs> and I'm just I'm repeating myself because of how stupid it is. If you <laughs> try to connect something like an engine room to the grid and it's 21 spaces away, even if there should be enough power, the game will just arbitrarily decide that this Majingo Garrison is not going to get power. Like it, like the, the another way of thinking about it is that the power matters less. How much? I don't know. You tell me. It just decides that it's not going to get enough power to the extent that it normally would. You can try to overcome that by adding excessive amounts of engine rooms, but to save yourself the grief, just try to position your engine rooms so that they're within like no-brainer distance of whatever you know you're trying to power at the furthest at the furthest extent. Oh man, <laughs> I, do, I need I need a drink like an angry orchard or something. Um, so uh, what's what's the point? What's the point of power? The the the, the point of power is giving your garrisons nightlights which lets them see in the dark as well as they do in the light, uh, which matters when enemies are camping right outside your doorstep because your defenses are almost blind otherwise. The f and that's that's it. That's all That's all you're trying to account for, is just making sure that your garrisons have vision at all times. The fourth amenity, and we're almost, <laughs> almost there, I can see it. The fourth amenity is in place anti-tank guns, uh, which ideally should be fairly easily reachable by your base defenders. Uh, like, the way that you want to set up your base is so that your your defenders don't have to think at all. They should be able to just go from one end of your base to the other without having like a bunch of strange junk in between. That means that you would want to have... Uh, let's see if I can find a blank spot. Let's go over here, southwest. Just as an example, if this square that I'm going to put down is the is the bunker core, it should not be this far forward, I'm just using an example, you want people to be, be able to run from your core into the closest defense and like, a, like as quickly as possible, you then want God, let me just do it here. Okay, it is. It is. It's just, it's just being upset with me. Oh no, it's gonna be like that, huh? <laughs> it's, it's, it's gonna be like that, huh? All right, this is the car. This is the car now. <laughs> and pretend like this, this bit isn't here, and there's a trench between them. This is where your, your effing halberd starts. It goes down, literally right in front. Preferably you'd want this to be like a machine gun garrison or something that would be able to fire directly into the pit. You want a trench connector, and this is where I get a little blasphemic because some people religiously say never connect your doors to any other part of your base, which in, in my personal experience is, is wrong. Um, just pretend that that's a trench connector. Just pretend that that trench connector is there. You want your people to run from the core directly into your defense and then have an outlet into the emplaced gun. Um, that's, that's the principle. If the enemy does get close enough to the pit for it to matter, you will already have barbed wire out here, stopping them from easily getting in. And if for whatever reason the machine gunner that is pressing your machine gun here 
reloads or, or dies or something else happens to them. Like they have to go eat dinner or something and they leave. Um, the machine gun garrison is going to open fire on them the moment it can directly down into the pit. You would then run an anti-satchel trench, periodically dotting with hexes as you go. Then if you're feeling extraordinarily fancy and time and resources allow, you could alternate EMG, EAT, EMG, EAT all the way around, or probably what is better late game is just literally all ATs, EATs all the time and place anti-tank guns. One EAT is going to tie down like three tank crews or six plus people uh, just from being a deterrent. They just do not want to go anywhere near it justifiably. If infantry tries to get near your EATs to do damage to them, they're going to get lit up by the by the AI. If a tank tries to get close enough to protect the infantry, they're going to get lit up by both the EAT and the AT. So it's all about um, incorporating different layers of defenses. Uh, the, the fifth amenity, which is not strictly critical to the base itself and could even draw Sweat Lord attention to it, but can be war changing, is a super weapon. Super weapons need a block of three by three. Um, so like nine squares, just in a grid of three in any direction um, to form like a block, a square. Um, in my opinion, truthfully, the two types of uh, super weapons are equal um, in turn, like as far as usefulness goes. They need tons of space and additional protection due to the sword load issue I mentioned before. They also need a ton of sp extra space for the 12 engine rooms just for them. Um, uh, you can have less, you can have more. They do change the speed that the super weapons charge by a comparative amount, but they have diminishing returns. The more, the most that I would attach is like 18, uh, but at that point you would have enough space for like a second super weapon. They also cost tons of concrete too, um, so I don't recommend them unless you're playing with a group or you're masochistic. Um, either way, um, I would really respect that, but it would be a huge effort. The Storm Cannon has a 400 to 1000 meter range, wind, wind notwithstanding, with a massive splash and a very scary sound effect that you can hear over the border depending on what sound mods you have. Uh, Intel weapons act like giant listening kits that you can fire in a giant AoE bubble at a point in the map, um, stealing watchtower observation tower, observation bunker coverage, and so on uh, for 15 minutes per shot from 500 to 2000 meters that's not affected by wind, um, which is a huge distance. Um, over a hex and a half away. Each have power consumptions that are different per shot. Like, each takes a huge amount of, of power in order just to turn them, so you almost never want to turn them. You'll want to leave a sign or something that is outside of your super weapon that has approximate ranges that people can use. Or, in the instance of like an Intel's uh, weapon, like literally just like some point where you're capturing like an observation tower and like an observation bunker or something. And then just say, you know, this is a distance in azimuth uh, to capture this entire front. Um, that was extremely helpful to me a few wars ago where I was, I was firing off into weapons for like an hour and a half at a time, uh, back to back. And it was literally capturing the entire front. So like, like three, 300, 450 meters worth of radars, radar coverage in a big line uh, was, was being seen in real time. It actually got so bad that I was told that they were starting to wear recon uniforms because they didn't know how to deal with the fact that they couldn't get away with getting on their storm cannons. Like they, they would be seen getting on their storm cannons and people would already be ready to repair. Okay, so that's all that stuff. Uh, it takes about like two to three hours um, on average for a super weapon to charge to full, depending on how many of the special like mod benefits and stuff, but you can read what those tooltips are. Um, like the command mods and stuff, like each one says that they have like a special benefit attached to them. Um, one of them is reducing the amount of power it takes to uh, fire the super weapon. So we get to the tech system. The, the base tech system, uh, which is extremely poorly explained, like a lot of this other stuff I'm talking about, outside of a blurb in the tooltip of the base menu. The blurb says, technology improves automatically as long as you have enough total modifications of the type of upgrade you're aiming for in your base. Like four garrison modifications for rifles, six command modifications for observation tech. 
Many, many, many rumored things are said to speed up these upgrades, but the only things that we know for sure absolutely are having your spawn set to the base increases speed, putting things into the base increases speed, building structures around the bases increases speed. Other rumored things are like taking things out of the base, uh, being generally near the base, having a huge amount of items like 32,000 scrap in the base. That's why you you think people are like kleptomaniacs when you glance at the map and they have like 32,000 scrap in and like a frontline base and you're like, why? Why would anyone go through the effort? Um, respawning at the base is also thought to improve it. Um, they could all speed it up. Or maybe they don't. <laughs> Only Devman chooses to release that info, so your mileage is going to vary if that's true or not. It could be like orcs from like Warhammer 40,000, where if you paint the thing red and you believe in it, it really does go faster. Um, on its own, the base provides ma passive technology points. So even if it's left completely alone and isolated, it will slowly upgrade itself over time. Um, if a person spawns, if a person spawn is set to the base but they don't choose what they want to improve tech-wise, it's going to split up whatever their contribution is across all the options that are available to them. You can choose what you want your own points to go to, like investing all of it, by setting your spawn to the base and clicking the upgrade you want. So there's a little check mark next to it. Last. Lastly, I've completely lost sight of how long I've been talking, but that's, I mean, we're, we're at the end now, if you can believe it. We'll talk about everyone's favorite subject, which is bunker supplies versus garrison supplies. In short, <laughs> bunker supplies keep only trenches and bunker pieces from decaying. This also means that they won't stop encampments from decaying, even if the encampment itself has bunker supplies in it and is stopping other stuff from decaying around it. That's why if you see encampments by themselves with bunker supplies in it, you'll see that everything around them is fine, but the encampment is down to like 60% health. And there's nothing in the game that's telling you why. It's because the encampment itself is not... It's, it sounds so stupid, because it is. The, the encampment itself is not a bugger piece or a trench, so the game doesn't count it. Like, like why? Like, why? Like, damn, bitch, you live like this? <laughs> so, to, to, to gauge, to gauge how many you need, like, the, the garrisons, like, leave literally everything alive. So the garrisons, let me get back on topic. The garrisons leave everything alive, including shipping containers, boxes, walls, random trash, it, if it's if it's a thing that you build and is not a bunker, a bunker piece or a trench, it's going to keep it alive. Um, if a base has access to both types, both garrison supplies and bunker supplies, it's going to use up literally all of the garrison supplies first, and then it's going to default to bunker supplies. The premise being that the game thinks, oh well, this is like an active front where there's like barbed wire and sandbags and and uh, like tripod guns which apparently also count uh, like I should keep this stuff alive so I'm going to use all the garrison supplies first um, and then it will use bunker supplies and let everything else decay uh, so to gauge how many you need of, of whatever kind you have to think about what like what the purpose of the base is if it's front line a rule of thumb is use garrison supplies if it's back line or you think that the, the front has moved up so far, just use bunker supplies, because that'll let all the things like the random pillboxes and crap decay, which, because you don't want that to be like a supply drain on on your lodgy. It just wastes everyone's time, and Lord knows that garrison supplies are a huge pain to get. Um, so how do, you, how do you figure out like literally how many you need? You have to take a crate of whatever your, your choice of supply is, like garrison, for example. You have to wait until your bunker pieces natural decay timer ends. So for tier one, that's like 12 hours, although you wouldn't really ever leave stuff left tier one. Um, tier two decays after 48 hours. It just starts taking passive damage over time after the 48 limit mark if nothing is stopping it. Um, concrete takes 72 hours to decay. The the timers, like the decay timer, how long it takes to start taking damage, resets every time you upgrade that individual piece. So if it's tier one, you can, like, unless it's a trench, because trenches play by their own rules and just decay seemingly right away no matter what. If it's tier one, 
you have 12 hours. If at hour 11, you upgrade it to tier two, you then have 48 hours worth of, hello. You got it on in. I'm gonna see if they, or I don't know, maybe they're, I can't, can't hear you. <laughs> so, where, 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 where was I? Okay, so what you have to do to gauge how many you need is wait for the bucket pieces decay timer to run out. Uh, if, like at hour 47, you have tier 2, you upgrade it to tier 3 with concrete. Here, I figured that was going to happen. I made it, I have a advantage for you. Always be prepared. <laughs> I mean, your time is running out. You're going to want to use advantage. Or just die. I don't know. I'm not your dad. <laughs> so you have your garrison supplies and you go up to the thing you're sure that it's going to start decaying soon you put in the crate of uh, supplies into it and once the decay timer runs out it'll then start using the supplies you have to hover your mouse over the little like bunker supply icon for it to give you an exact readout of how many supplies per hour everything within range is gonna it's gonna take like everything within that bunker cores like 80 meters radius or whatever it is, like the 150 meters to the tunnel and so on. You take that number per hour, multiply it by 24, and that's the total amount per day that you're going to need to account for. You take that total number, you divide it by 150 because there's 150 supplies in the crate, and then that tell, and then you basically post in your Discord, hey, this this base is going to need as of right now like 10 crates per day to keep alive. And it's, it makes it real easy and simple for everyone. Um, so the, your daily checkup as like an engineer is re-reserving everything so that it goes to its full cap and nobody can screw with you. You regas everything so that you have night lights on at all times. And then you check what the garrison supplies are and top it up to 24 hours. For me personally, I'm confident enough in what I build that I try to keep a minimum 48 hours of supply in it, so it's just literally brain dead for me. I regas, re-reserve, and resupply, and then I don't have to worry about literally any of that for 36 hours or whoever it is that's going to be taking care of it. Lastly, very very lastly, I know I said lastly once, but this this will save your life, is get an auto clicker program. Uh, it's not against terms of service, you're literally just automating the clicks that you would be doing to the point that you would get carpal tunnel, or holding it, or whatever. If you're going to be doing any building long term, you you, you need you like you need it. I'm not kidding. Like I recommend one called NI Auto Clicker, and as a Nick Auto Clicker, you'll want a sign outside your base. Um, otherwise, uh, give your base a name. I'm not kidding. Both for you and for other people to reference. If Logi and Defenders get attached to your base on an emo emotional level, it improves the chances that they're going to bother defending it and supplying it. Include the order that you want things to tech in in the sign, like saying, I want Rifle Garrison, Tier 2 AI, um, Observation Bunker, Concrete, uh, whatever. Like, whatever the order is. Like, in my opinion, it should be Rifle Garrison, because you want that shit in place, like, for when the AI goes live. Um, tier 2 AI, uh, AT is the next one, Observation Bunker, Howitzer, yeah, Observation Bunker, Concrete, how is there a deploy point? <laughs> say that, say that 50 times fast. Yeah, Windows also has a built-in click lock. The ad the advantage of like it's called click hold. You go into mouse settings, additional mouse settings, and then you know it's helpful for when you're building a CV because you can just like hold down your mouse button for like a second or something, and it just assumes you want to keep the button held down. The advantage of having an auto clicker is that you can look at other page like websites you can watch like you can interact with other games like it sounds stupid like it's treating the foxhole like a cookie clicker game where it's, or like an idle game where it's just going on in the background bruh that's that's half of engineering i'm gonna break it to you now half of the engineering is is plotting and digging the other half is going to be youtube or nintendo switch or you know, like Fire Emblem Three Houses or whatever your preferred 
you know, secondary distraction is. If your wife ever <laughs> asks you, hey, like, are you super bored of one game that you're, you know, you're playing two? And, well, no, because you're getting the enjoyment of two games at the same time. And if you have Twitch or YouTube up, then you're extracting fun out of a third person who might also be doing the same thing. So you're you're taking three times the amount of dopamine and <laughs> and concentrating it into into your cranium. Like just just take me on faith on this. Um, yeah, that's 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 it. That's it. That's that's pretty much everything that that goes in the building.